Well, hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is you're watching this. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 71 of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for the week of August 30th through September 5th, 2012. I'm your host, my name's Larry Erickson, and for the next almost half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur, talking about things important to me I think deserve your attention. Uh, as always, any responses to the show, good or bad, tips, whatever, can be sent to me directly at hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And as I'm sure you didn't catch that, uh, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, um, and uh, you can get the email address directly from there. Uh, as always, um, I ask if, you'll be, if you send me email, be a little patient. I do answer my email, sometimes a little slow about it. And please include something like your subject, uh, uh, something like uh, your cable show or left side of the aisle, something like that in the subject line so that I know it's not spam. Okay, so with those traditional preliminaries out of the way, we will start. Uh, we're going to jump, jump directly into our regular weekly feature, The Outrage of the Week. Back in April, I told you about what was then the newly passed Jobs Act, which stands for, in one of the most weirdly forced acronyms ever, the Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act. Uh, this bill passed Congress overwhelmingly with bipartisan support, and Barack Obama signed it. Everybody loves the thing, and, well, I mean, who could be against it? It's about jobs. <laughs> jobs. Well, as I said then, and as I said now, the jobs bill is well named because it's a bunch of JOs pushing BS. Um, the supposed purpose of this law is to enable our dynamic entrepreneurs to revitalize the economy by helping them fund startup businesses. Uh, the, way, the, way does, the way the bill does this, well, first, it uh, uh, exempts these startups from some federal reporting and accounting requirements. And second, it wants to make it easier for them to raise funds, first by lifting the ban on advertising for investors, and second, by allowing for crowdfunding, so-called. This is where you go on social media and try to raise a lot of money by getting a little money from a whole lot of people. In short, what this bill does is allows these startups to raise millions of dollars in money without having to tell their investors much of anything about the company or its finances. All those nasty disclosure requirements are gone. All those pesky accounting requirements are gone. And all that you have left uh, is the brightly colored brochures and the web ads full of you can be as rich as Mitt Romney promises. What could go wrong? Economists actually say that this bill will open the floodgates to massive fraud. Um, and say the crowdfunding could make the scams of the 1980s look like parking violations. State-level regulators complain that, as a result of this bill, not only won't the feds be regulating any of these things, the states won't be able to either, that this fundraising will be essentially completely unregulated. A group of white-collar criminologists called the bill an atrocity and something only a financial scavenger could love, uh, and said it was basically a wish list of fraud-friendly provisions. And, and indeed, the Consumer Federation of America, they said that this bill was passed despite the lack of any evidence that these entrepreneurs are having any trouble raising money. In other words, it was passed without any evidence that there was actually a problem that it proposed to solve. We've been down this road before. We have. For the last 40 years or so, at least, uh, maybe more now, we've been looking to see what we can deregulate. We deregulated some banks and financial institutions. We got the SNL crisis. Uh, we deregulated some more. We got Enron, WorldCom, all of those. In the 1990s, we actually did lift the ban on advertising for investors and found that fraud went up so much so fast that the ban was reinstituted. Uh, Despite this, we looked around, let's deregulate some more, more, some more deregulation, and we saw the entire financial industry melt down in 2008. And yet the response to all of this in each case has been, what else can we deregulate? No matter how many failures there have been, in fact, now we're trying to go back and, re and repeat previous failures. 
On top of this, the Jobs Act very likely will not produce any new jobs because it increases the risk of fraud, which means it increases the risk to investors and therefore increases the cost of capital. Okay, that uh, you know, you're, you're going to want more of a return on investment the more risk there is to that investment. So what this means is that any honest entrepreneur who really does want to start a new business may find it harder, not easier, to raise capital as a result of this act. Now, the Security and Ex Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, is supposed to be like the cop on the beat for investor protection. And what are they doing? They are trying to ram through the, re the, the rules that would allow uh, the Jobs Act to be implemented, in effect, to open the floodgates to fraud. Um, in fact, they were so eager to do this that back on August 22nd, they tried to promulgate the rules without allowing for the federally required period of public comment. Now, they backed off that after the Consumer Federation of America and, uh, and a group of distinguished co-signers sent a letter, a very stinging, pointed letter to the SEC, noting how they were proposing to violate federal law. Instead, the SEC is supposed to be holding a vote. Now, it's supposed to be done on August 29th. That's today, the day I'm taping this, so I don't know what's happened with it. But they're supposed to be holding a vote today on whether or not they will send things out for public comment. The thing is now, at the same time, at the same time, the SEC is trying to do an end run around the public and around the law to make it easier in the name of starting new corporations for the cheats, chiselers, and ripoff artists to defraud the rest of us. At the same time that it's doing this, it has just announced that it is abandoning plans to impose tougher rules on, on uh, money market mutual funds. That's a move that the former chair of the SEC, a guy named Arthur Levitt, called the national disgrace. And the thing is, you want to know why that's happening? You want to know why that regulation is failing? There's one reason and one reason only. The sponsors of money market funds, which include outfits like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, they don't want it. Making things easier for the fraudsters and the big banks, and pardon my redundancy, making it easier for them, make it harder for honest investors, that's what the SEC is doing because whatever the big banks want, the big banks get. And I gotta tell you, this ain't no musical. This is the outrage of the week. Okay, from there to something else that I have talked about before, and I'm sure I'll be talking about it again. In fact, I'll probably be talking about this straight through the election and beyond. I've been talking about it, I discovered by looking back at some previous things. I've been talking about this for over a year now. This is about restrictions on the right to vote. Uh, I especially have been, in that time, I've been focusing on these inane voter photo ID laws. But that's not the only uh, uh, method being used by the right wing. And, and make no mistake, this is a project of the right. Uh, it's not, that's not the only method being used by the right wing to try to um, restrict the ability to vote of people that they think are not reliably right-wing, like students, uh, the poor, and minorities. There have been, besides these ID laws, there have been restrictions on early voting, which the record says is used disproportionately by minority voters. There have been legal moves and other attempts to restrict the ability to register to vote, down to, like, blocking, uh, in, in, in essence, blocking all voter registration drives, which happened in Florida, to simply somehow not having enough voter registration forms, which happened recently in New Mexico. Um, there's, well, actually, based on that, by the way, the, the voter registration encouraged people to vote, to, to register. Uh, before I forget about this, there's a case like this actually in Massachusetts, in Massachusetts. The National Voter Registration Act of 1993 requires states to provide um, information about registering to vote to people when they um, uh, register their car or when they apply for services like welfare or unemployment. Well, several voting rights uh, uh, organizations had brought suit against the state of Massachusetts because the state had been in gross violation of parts of that law. 
As part of an interim out-of-court settlement, the state has now sent voter registration forms to every welfare recipient. Well, our own Senator Scott Brown, uh, he's frothing at the mouth about this. He's whining and grousing, saying how this is all a political plot to just hurt him. And, of course, the truth is it will, because he knows that if poor people actually to vote, they are more likely to vote for Elizabeth Warren than they are for him. But the thing is, this is still about the right wing trying to restrict the ability of people not reliably right wing to vote. There's news from all over the country about this, from Ohio and Texas, South Carolina, Florida, New Hampshire, New Mexico, more. Uh, talking about this is going to be an ongoing thing here at left side of the aisle. But I did want to mention a couple of uh, specific things about a specific case that I have been talking about these past few weeks. Uh, and that is the suit in Pennsylvania against that state's photo ID law. Uh, as I said previously, uh, the judge in the case, Robert Simpson, refused to enjoin the law, refused to block its implementation. So unless the state Supreme Court basically unexpectedly overturns that ruling, uh, the law may well be in effect come November. I also told you that the very day that decision came down, the administration of Pennsylvania Governor Tom Corbett, who has proved himself a real space cadet, and if you get that, you're as old as I am, but the administration of, of Governor Corbett announced it was shutting down a program to make it easier to get an absentee ballot. Something, though, I haven't told you about yet. The week after that, the Corbett administration also announced it was refusing to cooperate with a Department of Justice investigation to see if the law violated the Voting Rights Act. In fact, the DOJ's request for documents was rejected in a manner that can only be regarded as sneering and insulting. The let in fact, the letter from the state, get this now, the letter from the state started by referring to the way the DOJ handled with complaints about voter, uh, voter intimidation by two members of the uh, new Black Panther Party at a Philadelphia polling place in 2008. Now, this, this, this thing, this is this right-wing fantasy, okay? It, re it really is, this right-wing fantasy. I mean, I swear these two guys must have been hired by some right-wing outfit. It has been so useful to the right. Uh, Basically, the New Black Panther Party, which, by the way, has absolutely no connection whatsoever to the original Black Panther Party, the New Black Panther Party consists of a handful of fringoids who essentially no one had ever heard of before this incident and essentially no one has ever heard of since. This was two guys at one polling place, one where no one has ever actually said that they felt intimidated in any way. But that, that one incident, according to the state of Pennsylvania, matters more than the tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of Pennsylvanians who are going to be denied their right to vote in order to deal with a crime, voter impersonation, which the state of Pennsylvania has admitted in writing basically does not exist. After that, this same letter went on to claim that the DOJ doesn't have the authority to do such an investigation. Guess what? It does. Um, and to accuse the agency of political motivation and of targeting, I'm quoting here, a growing number of states simply because they instituted legislation designed to ensure the integrity of the voting process. Put more bluntly, the state of Pennsylvania is accusing the Department of Justice of wanting to have corrupt elections. I think this is another right-wing fantasy, another right-wing fantasy. Anytime anybody to their left, the, the most moderate centrist Democrat, gets elected, they're immediately convinced the first thing that jumps to their mind is fraud. It's simply the, the idea that no one to their left could possibly win an election without cheating is part of their political DNA. And th these kind of sneering and insulting fantasies um, were not enough for the Corbett administration. The letter also said that the state would, in fact, provide the information the GOG requested if the DOJ would sign a confidentiality agreement. Now, 
Whatever you think about privacy protections, and if you've watched this show more than a little while, uh, you know I'm very big on them. But whatever you think about them, that, that thing, that demand for the, for the uh, confidentiality agreement is such a sniggering, sneering, sophomoric slap that I genuinely imagine the author of the letter giggling when they wrote it down. Um, now, there's one other, one other important thing I want to bring up here. I mentioned last week, again, that in Judge Simpson's decision, he wrote that the law, and I'm quoting him here, is a reasonable, non-discriminatory, non-severe burden when viewed in the broader context of the widespread use of photo ID in real life. Now, I said at the time that Simpson is apparently one of these blockheads that can't get it through his thick skull, that not everybody routinely gets on a plane or checks into a hotel or even drives. But this time, I want to address those other two terms. Non-discriminatory? Of course it's discriminatory. Anytime a law uh, disproportionately affects certain identifiable groups, like in this case, the poor, minorities, the elderly, and the young, um, then that's the definition of discriminatory. But of course it's discriminatory. Um, but here's the real thing. Here's the real thing I want to, non-severe burden. It's a non-severe burden. Which means that Simpson is ruling that any burden placed on voting, he's, accept, he's saying that any such burden is acceptable, legal, it's constitutional, it's just, it's fair, it's proper, it's right, so long as that burden is not severe. Damn it, for all of its shortcomings, for all of its failings, for all of its disappointments, voting remains a, a centerpiece, a cornerstone, a, a, a linchpin, a keystone in what it means to have a free nation. It is a core value, a core aspect of having a democracy or a republic, of having representative government. It is the central organizing principle of what it means to have a government of, by, and for the people rather than the other way around. So why are we talking about severe or non-severe burdens? The question should not be, is this burden too severe? The question should be, is this burden necessary? The burden of proof should not be to prove that somehow you can jump through these hoops or somehow you can't jump through these hoops. The burden of proof should be on those who say, this is actually something necessary. Why should there be any restrictions on voting that are not necessary? You know, just a few years ago, and you know, when I say this, you'll go, oh yeah, I remember that. You probably haven't thought about it in a while, but yeah, I remember that. Not that long ago, our concern was about how few people were voting. Uh, how about low turnouts? About how the voter participation rate in elections in this country was embarrassing. How even in presidential years, which get the highest turnout, the turnout of registered voters may only be like around 60%. And when you consider that only half of eligible voters are registered, that means that in a close election, somebody could be elected with as little as like 15% of the actual population. All the talk was about how we could get more people to the polls, about how we get more people registered, more people involved how to remove roadblocks between the, the voter and the voting booth. That was the point of that National uh, uh, Voter Registration Act in 1993. That was the point of it. It was also known, you may remember this, as the Motor Voter Act because of the way that the act used um, uh, uh, auto registration points, like DMVs in the states, as, um, as uh, contact points for promoting voting re uh, voter registration. Now, just a relatively few years of right-wing screeching, lying, and significantly media collaboration later, just a few years later, all the talk is about how many roadblocks we can put on that same path to the voting booth, how hard we can make it to register, how hard we can make it to vote. So what this is about is power. It's about power, and don't you ever forget it. It's about the desire of the right wing for power, about the desire for the right wing to create a permanent structural bias in favor of right wing voters, a, 
uh, and right-wing government, a permanent structural bias in favor of the haves over the have-nots, a permanent structural bias in favor of the needless over the needy, a permanent structural bias against any notion of progress and reform in the lives of the many as opposed to the selfish benefit of the few. That's what this is about. So here's the deal. You think your vote is safe? Well, if you reliably vote for the oligarchs, it probably is. Otherwise, otherwise. And we are going to take a break. Here we are. We're back again, uh, as if you're surprised about that. Um, anyway, right now we're going to go to our occasional feature, the Clarabelle Award. Clarabelle Award, given as needed for acts of meritorious stupidity. Uh, I had several candidates for the award this week, uh, sort of like an embarrassment of embarrassments, if you will. Um, but recalling the standard is meritorious stupidity. Yeah, one just stood out. Among the also-rans was one guy, Tom Smith. He's the Gopper candidate for Senate in Pennsylvania this year. He's another one of these lame-brain bozos who wants to restrict access to abortion, even in the cases of incest and rape. On, October to, uh, on August 27th, uh, he was asked by a reporter how he would handle a daughter or granddaughter who became pregnant as a result of a rape. He said that he had already lived through something similar to that in his family. When a reporters pressed him about what kind of situation was similar to becoming uh, pregnant as a result of the rape, he said, having a baby out of wedlock. Put yourself in a father's position. Yes, it is similar. Well, his campaign later insisted that it was all a misunderstanding and that he specifically denied he was actually making that comparison, even though he actually just already had. Um, but I guess it's another case where he misspoke. He misspoke. Apparently, when he said, yes, it is similar, he actually meant to say, meant to say, no, they're not like anything at each other at all, but the other word just sort of slipped out by accident. Another entrant was Rob Moore, the CEO of, Murray, a CFO rather, of uh, Murray Energy Company. Now, Murray Energy owns the Century Mine. It's a coal mine in Bealsville, Ohio. And earlier this month, uh, Witless Romney had a campaign appearance there with hundreds of coal workers and their families present. Uh, but now, a number of those workers are saying that um, they were required, they were forced to attend this, uh, this event, and they lost a day's pay in order to do it. And they only went because they were afraid they'd be fired if they didn't. Well, Moore said he was denying those claims, but what he actually said was, first, uh, it's true workers weren't paid for that day, and second, get this now, this is a quote, our managers communicated to our workforce that the attendance at the Romney event was mandatory, but no one was forced to attend. Paraphrasing Arthur Dent, this must be some new meaning of the word mandatory, of which I was previously unaware. As that is really Clarabelle territory. But in fact, that was going to be the winner. That was going to be the winner until I heard about the administrators of the Grand Island Public Schools of Grand Island, Nebraska. They are this week's dishonorees. Um, Hunter Spanger is a three-year-old boy who attends preschool there. He's deaf. He uses SEE, which is um, Signing Exact English, for his sign language. The problem is his name. The way he signs his name, Hunter, is by crossing his index and middle fingers like this and wagging them slightly. As a result, the superior intellects of the Grand Island uh, Nebraska school system wanted to be forced to change the way he signs his name because they say this looks too much like a gun and it runs afoul of the school uh, uh, rules that ban any instrument that resembles a weapon. So according to these brilliant minds, the fingers of a three-year-old are an instrument somebody might think is a gun. As for any resemblance of the signs, well, the kid's name is Hunter. So, of course, he uses a slightly modified sign for Hunter, which is going to involve some kind of gun. But bear in mind, this is the important thing. Bear in mind that the way Hunter signs his name is the way he introduces himself to the world. This is not a symbol. That, that is his name. That sign is his name. 
by telling the parents that they have to change the way he signs that, they're telling the parents that they have to change his name in order to please the school administrators. Um, and, if, and if you don't get how bizarre that is, just suppose he wasn't deaf. Suppose he communicated orally and he said, my name is Hunter. Do you think the school would demand that his parents change his name because the word Hunter relates to guns? You know the answer to that as well as I do. The ACLU was written to the district asking the policy be reconsidered. The National Association of the Deaf is prepared to assist these spangers in legal action if necessary. Now, a representative of the district said that the school is trying to find the best solution for a preschooler hunter. The best solution is for the school officials to apologize to the Spangers and drop the whole thing after realizing they have been astonishingly insensitive and appallingly ignorant clowns. All right. There is so much more that I would like to talk about. Um, so many things that should be said, that should be covered. There's the Israeli court that, that blamed Rachel Corey for her own killing. There's, I haven't talked about the economy in weeks. Um, there's threats to privacy from both the government and corporations. There are the inter interrelated issues of WikiLeaks, uh, 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 Julian Assange and Bradley Manning, uh, restrictions on the right of public protest. But this is something I've been meaning to talk about, trying to talk about for a month and haven't because there was always something more important. So I um, promised myself I was going to include it this week. It's about global warming. Uh, a while back, I told you about Richard Muller, a professor of physics at UCAL Berkeley, who put together a group that he said was going to re-examine all the data about global warming because he didn't think it was, um, that it was actually uh, accurate. So, well, this is what happened. This is a graph of the rise in temperatures as shown by three different data sets. This is what happened when Mueller's analysis was added. Oops. Mueller was forced to admit that the original data was accurate. Now, why am I bringing this up now? Because a month ago, which is the whole time I've been wanting to talk about this, Mueller wrote in the New York Times, call me a converted skeptic. He now not only agrees that the data is correct, he agrees that humans are the cause of the increase in temperature. It's another example of what happens when somebody looks at the data with their eyes instead of ideological biases. When you do that, only one answer comes out. Global warming is real, it's happening now, and we are in serious trouble. How serious? Consider this. Um, right now, the data keeps piling up. The Arctic Ocean has reached its smallest ice extent ever already this year, and it's going to keep shrinking for at least a couple more weeks. Uh, and the Arctic ice helps moderate temperatures to the south, so the effect there is going to translate down to effects other places. But speaking of probabilities, here's the factoid to wrap this thing up. July was the 329th consecutive month in which the temperature of the globe exceeded the average of that month for the 20th century. The odds of that occurring by simple chance are 1 in 3.7 times 10 to the 99th. It's 1 in this many. Those are the odds you are going against when you deny global warming. That's it. I'm out of time. You have the best week you can. I'm out of here. We'll see you next week. Bye.